you're interested in art, you can get into muzzleloading. Mm -hmm. Literature, you can get into muzzleloading. Shooting, you can get into muzzleloading. You know, there's even if you're just interested in camping, I mean, half the people yeah. that I know that like muzzleloaders, <laughs> they just like going out and camping and having a flintlock set up next to the tree, you know? Listening to the Muzzle Loaders Podcast, the show where we talk about anything and everything black powder. How's it going, guys? It's Darren with muzzleloaders.com, and you're listening to the Muzzle Loaders Podcast. Uh, I'm here with Ethan Yazel of I Love Muzzle Loading, and we are going to be talking um, about kits again. Uh, you guys listened to our part one kit building podcast. You guys really liked it and wanted another one, so. Uh, we are going to do part two here, and I think we're going to focus a little bit more on the uh, in-depth aspect of building kits. Uh, last time we focused on building, uh, you know, on the tools required and that sort of thing. This go around, we're going to talk a little bit more detail, a little bit more specific, and uh, so stay tuned for that. And if you haven't seen the first one, I'll be sure to put a link to that above so you can check that out and then come back and watch this one after you've already seen that one. So, uh, Ethan, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, Darren. Thank you so much for having me back on. I, I love talking about kits and muzzleloaders, so it's, it was uh, really nice to be asked back. Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're a, you're a friend of the show, and uh, we always love what you have to say. So, um, Thank you. How, just starting off, how, is th how are things with the InvestArm kit going? I've been watching the video. It looks like we're on part, part seven now or something like that, part nine. I, yeah, we're getting ready. To, I think this week is 10, and then next week will be 11 as we're recording. Hopefully, by the time that folks are listening to this, we're closer to the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not upset about it. It's it's taken a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm, I'm happy that it has because the, the kit has a lot more room for, for me and I think other people out there to breathe mm -hmm. as they're putting it together. There's a lot more space for you to make it your own than other kits I've put together, which has been really nice. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's kind of the, that's kind of something is, you know, the, the length of time that it takes to put together a kit. Um, mm -hmm. We usually say it could take, you know, take you th plan to have three months at least to set to, you know, to build a kit. Um, but I, I suppose you could do it faster. You know, I'm sure you could get it, throw it together, dry fit it. You know, I know people that have never, they don't stain it or anything. They just leave everything just totally raw. Um, oh my! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't. But the thing is, one of the things that you said in in one of your recent videos that I really liked is that um, when you're building your kit, even your first kit could last you a lifetime. So you may as well take mm -hmm. the extra time to make it nice and to make it how you like it. Yeah, and that's something I, I try to reiterate a lot for folks, just because I myself find myself getting excited and getting anxious about wanting it to be done. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I work, you know, nine to five during the week, and I just have a few hours every weekend to put into my kit, which is part of why videos are slow to come out on it. But when I'm doing that, I'm thinking all during the week, I'm going to get so much done. And then I get into the shop and it's, you know, like eight o'clock on a Saturday night and like, I'm, <laughs> it's time to stop. And I'm, I'm kind of, you know, trying to make some decisions that might speed it up. But I always try to remind myself that this is, I get one shot really to do this the way I want it to easily. Mm -hmm. Now I could go back and take stain off and finish off and and file all of my hardware back, you know, and remove the finish if I really wanted to redo it. But it's not nearly as much fun. It's not nearly as easy than trying to do it, you know, patiently and, and the way you really want it the first time, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of just a little life lesson for everyone listening as well Is don't try and rush through anything that you're doing, you know, take the time to yeah. make sure it's good because ultimately you're going to save time in the long run, you know, because yep. uh, if you, you know, you end up building a second kit, which you might do anyways, but you don't want to have to yep. build a second kit because your first one turned out horribly. You know, you want to build another one because you enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, as I think a lot of kits now are, are affordable for, for, especially for what you get. But mm. even then, you know, we're all saving money. We're all working to afford, you know, what we can have. And I think if you're, if you're saving up the money to get one of these kits, it just makes a lot of sense to put in, you know, a few extra hours so that, you know, a year, year and a half down the road, you're not looking at it, wishing that you had something better or something nicer. You know, yeah. you can put that time in early and, and really have something to cherish for a long time. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, as someone who's experienced building kits, what are a few simple things that, that people can do uh, that aren't, you know, really in-depth and hard to do, but something like little detailed stuff that can make the kit look really nice in the end? Yeah, I talk a lot about uh, just in general fit and finish when it comes to, to putting together a kit. I mean, as far as the inletting goes on most kits now, you don't really have to do a whole lot. And so that's really nice. You know, your heart, your, your metal to wood, uh, like around your lock plate and, you know, if you have a side plate or your entry pipes and things, your nose caps, it's all pretty clean as it comes. But sometimes a lot of the kit manufacturers will leave extra wood in those areas, like around your wrist or your cheek piece, for example, on that Invest Arms kit I'm putting together. And I think if you go through and, and really take the time to match those areas, uh, like the cheek piece or like the nose cap, for instance, the wood comes pretty bulky around that. And taking the wood down to where it matches evenly with that nose cap, mm. it's nice and flush. It's really going to slim down your stock, and it's going to just make it lighter and, and more ornate. And I think for me, importantly, the thing I try to get across is that when you match up those areas that are left for you to match, it matches with how it comes from the factory. So, like, the lock inlet is perfect. You know, I don't need to do anything to it. But if I have that perfect lock inlet and then my nose cap, you know, wood finish around that is uneven or rough or it's really bulky. Mm -hmm. It's going to kind of throw your eye off a little bit. That's something you're going to see a little bit of an imbalance there. I think that even though we have, uh, you know, not necessarily totally 100% historically traditional mm -hmm. uh, designs on the kits, they're still designed with a lot of artistic principles in mind of, of art and balance and kind of composition. And when you go through and, and even up those finishes uh, between your wood and the metal and the areas that you're left to, I think it really helps out. And another thing I'd say is, you know, going through and really polishing up your metal parts. Mm, yeah. uh, like the Invest Arms kit comes really nice because it, it comes as kind of a matte gray finish on everything. It's not like a rough sand casting that you can get if you're building from a blank or building other kits that are out there. And so when you get it, it looks it looks pretty nice. And you could, you know, go ahead and just, you know, brown or blue that, I imagine, and, and stick it back on there. But um, by going through, like I talk about in the videos, and, and sanding and filing all of your hardware pieces back to a kind of a dull polish with your files and your sandpaper, you then can really control the color mm -hmm. and the overall finish of it. You're not really... There's nothing out of your control then. If, if you want your pieces a little bit darker or a, a little bit different just in the, in the level of polish that you have, you can control that. And I think that makes it all the more special to you and then to somebody else down the road mm -hmm. that you might be handing the, the kit down to. Well, and walk me through a little bit of, of polishing that because all of this stuff mm -hmm. is covered in detail in your, in your tutorial that you're making right now. Um, yeah. But just for our listeners... Can you walk me through the polishing process, like what sandpaper you use and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I really start with, uh, I'm fortunate, I have a, I have a pretty well-stocked shop. I'm kind of a, a third-generation home shop, a home workshop enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So I go through and, and kind of use whatever tool I need to. But what I really start with is a, a nice, fine file when I'm working on uh, on those castings, on that kit specifically. If I was using a, a rough sand cast piece of hardware or something, I'd, I'd use a rougher file. But I kind of have a worn out half round file that I go through and remove that mottled gray finish that's on there. And I, I would do that just for about anything. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, again, it's kind of a worn out half round file, so it's not super aggressive, but it's just enough to get that, uh, you know, the casting finish off of there. And from there, I, I do all the parts with that that with that file with a single pass. Get them all to a not kind of shiny, scratchy, gray look. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like around my trigger guard and things, I might use some other files to to bring out some more detail if I want to establish some facets or faces on anything. I'll go through and do that. And then I jump to a pretty rough sandpaper. I'm talking like a an eighty. 90 grit, you know, maybe 100 is kind of your baseline. And I'm going to scratch that surface up again. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on how your file finish is, you don't necessarily need to do that if you're happy with where it's at. But that's going to, again, kind of unify that surface a little bit and get us ready to start moving up in sandpaper quality and sandpaper grit. Now, I usually top out at about like a 240 grit 
on uh, on what I do with my parts, and then I'll take them to kind of a polishing or buffing wheel, mm-hmm. and clean it up there if I want a nice, super even, you know, super clean, high polish on something. But you'll see folks out there that go up to a 600, 800 grit sandpaper on their parts to get a really nice hand, you know, hand sanded polish on that. It's it's all about what what you want out of your kit. So I try to make a a nice looking kit. Um, that has a little bit of age to it. So that's where I top out at that at that 240. And all the sandpaper that I use, I use um, I, a technique called file-backed sandpaper. And when you're working on your hardware like we are on these muzzle loaders, it's important to keep the original shapes, especially on parts that are inlet into your stock, where we, like we talked about earlier, mm. mated the hardware to the wood. We don't want to mess that up at all. And so by putting a file on the back of our sandpaper as we're stroking and as we're sanding our pieces that keeps a nice rigid surface on our sandpaper so we're not disturbing any of those crisp lines on the hardware it makes it that just makes it easier down the road for cleanup and that's just a really old school kind of woodworking or or metal working practice it's good to get in the habit of doing yeah and uh along those lines we covered antiquing in general mm-hmm. in the last podcast uh, what sort of antiquing are you doing to the brass pieces or in the case of the investor you're currently working on the, you know, like the iron pieces? Yeah. So on the uh, tradition St. Louis, Louis Hawk and I did, I did, um, I just did some traditional brass black. I think it's from, um, I can't think like Casey's, I think now, um, and went through and, and applied that and um, did a few coats of that, you know, applying it and then removing it and applying it. And I think that's really the thing that I see folks, um, you know, maybe kind of missing out on when it comes to antiquing their muzzle loaders a little bit is it, it's another process, just like the sanding and filing and the fitting, where the longer you take with it and the more passes you go with it, you can kind of achieve a, a better and a different look with it. Mm-hmm. With this Invest Arms, I'm really looking at doing a, a more traditional finish of browning all of the hardware uh, with some rust browning. So we're going to be building kind of a, a humidity box, a moisture mm-hmm. box to help aid kind of some fast rusting with it, which is a, a more traditional uh, finish for those kind of, uh, for the Hawken era especially. Um, but it's going to kind of give us a nice um, little bit of pitting I'm hoping to get out of it to give it a little bit of wear and tear, but a nice even brown finish on it so that it kind of blends in. There won't be anything too shiny, Mm -hmm. I don't think, on this kit when we're done with it. Talk to me about the uh, moisture box. So what what is that and how do you make that for someone that wanted to do a similar finish? Yeah, so the rust browning is really neat because it's a more permanent finish than like a cold bluing would be. Uh, you can go through and do like rust bluing as well, but your the term rust when we're talking about these finishes is just that. It's rusting this iron hardware. And so it's like right now in the Midwest, it's just dry as could be because we're in the middle of winter and like my shop furnace is running. So uh, it's just dry as a bone. So if I was trying to rust these parts or rust brown them like we're doing, it's really hard to do that without any moisture in the air. Mm. Uh, In the middle of the summer and, you know, kind of a swampy climate, you could do it by just setting the parts outside almost (laughs) and they'd rust naturally and, and accelerate with the rust browning. But what we'll do is we'll apply this rust browning solution onto the polished and finished hardware parts and then we'll put them kind of in a a makeshift box that we're going to build with kind of a plastic trash bag liner inside of it we're going to suspend everything that we can so it's not touching anything so we don't get any uh you know weird patterns or any you know plastic lines almost and real, real quick on that do you do that with like fishing line or how do you suspend them you could do it with fishing line or thin wire uh, you know, you could ideally you're going to go through like the screw holes where parts would attach to your stock because you're not going to see those mm. like around your trigger guard. You're going to balance it kind of on the inside of that little area that flicks back on the inside of the trigger guard because you're not really going to see that a whole lot. And you can rotate the parts, too, as you're rusting them so you don't have one spot that might be uneven. Mm. Like the barrel, for instance, we're going to hang it from the from the hook breech on the end, just wrapping some wire around there. Because I'm not worried about the rust finish on that actual hook because that's going to be internal, so to speak, to the muzzleloader. I so see. So we'll build that, set that up to hang, and then just set like a little home humidifier underneath it mm. to pump just water vapor up into it keep it warm in the shop and with that water vapor going in there that's going to accelerate and activate the rust browning solutions 
and over time will start forming a layer of surface rust on all the pieces of hardware and if left long enough it'll actually start to pit like you would see in your in your barrel if you left a you know black powder charge in there over mm -hmm. time or didn't clean it and that's a, a real traditional and real i think in vogue or in style so to speak for contemporary builders right now is trying to get a really nice aged rust brown finish on it because it looks like or it aids in looking like your kit or your muzzleloader just kind of came out of the swamp somewhere uh, for the you know late eight, or early 1800s or late 1700s. Interesting, and that makes total sense on the trigger guard and other you know metal pieces. You mentioned doing that with the barrel itself, and so uh, it's my understanding that having pitting in the barrels is bad, you know. But how do, how do you accomplish pitting on the outside without that happening on the inside? So what, what I'll do is I'll go through and oil up the bore before I hang it up in there, just to make sure that it has a nice, even coating of protection. And when it comes to the rust browning, the rust that's formed from that is only going to form where that solution is applied. So I'm going to plug the muzzle when I'm applying that to make sure I'm not getting any down into that bore, because it will rust out your bore, which is bad. Mm -hmm. But by keeping that away from the actual bore and keeping it on the outside flats and carefully along the muzzle face, you know, the front end of the barrel there. Uh, that'll keep any any of that rust solution out of the bore. And then when you're done with it, you, you want to neutralize that rusting because that is a chemical reaction going there. So depending on the solution that you're using, you'll need some kind of uh, basic material like baking soda uh, and water to apply on that on all your hardware to rub and uh, and wet all of that to neutralize that rust and that will stop it rusting because if you don't neutralize it that rust could then start to work its way into the bore and will continue eating over all of your parts so you'll see folks uh, talk about assembling their kits rusting all of the hardware and then getting excited and, and put you know finishing without mm -hmm. neutralizing anything taking it out to shoot having a good time they they pull out their muzzleloader a few weeks later out of the safe and it's just covered in more rust mm, and you have mm -hmm. a lot of extreme pitting at that point. So it's always important when you're rusting, whether that's rust brown or rust blue, to go through and make sure you're neutralizing all of that as, uh, you know, as directed by the instructions of the solution they're using. Yeah, I think that's a that's a crucial note because that's a pretty expensive mistake. You know, if you, you know, if you do that and, you know, maybe it's maybe a couple of weeks, you can still salvage it. But if you put it in there, in, over the winter and you pick it up out in the spring for your next rendezvous, then you still, you know, you have all these problems and you may have to just get a new muzzleloader. Yeah. Yeah. And now as long as you keep it out of the bore and you keep it away from the internals of your lock and, uh, and like on this one, the, the lock comes kind of with a color case hardened finish on it, which I'm going to be leaving there, but you'll see a lot of folks will rust or, or brown their lock plates, their frizzins, and the cock of your flintlock or the hammer of a, you know, of a percussion muzzleloader. And you want to be careful there too because your lock, your trigger assembly, and your bore are really your key factors that you really don't want any rust inside there because it's really going to mess with the performance and the usability of your muzzleloader. If you were to leave your trigger guard or your butt plate unneutralized after a few weeks or a month, you're going to come out with a really well-aged looking <laughs> piece of hardware there. You know, you might like it, but it's, it's good to do it in a controlled environment where you're kind of keeping an eye on it because yeah. it, I'm not saying that after a month, it's going to be gone. Um, but you're going to have some, you're going to have some wear in there that you may not have wanted. <laughs> yeah. When you talk to like contemporary builders, uh, kind of the big names like the CLA show or something, you know, their aging process takes as long or longer as the actual building process from the blank. I mean, that's from taking like a, you know, a four by six piece of wood and turning that into a muzzleloader. The, getting the aging right to look as historically accurate as they can to look like an original piece takes a long time. And you can get that all the same with, with one of these kits. You just have to be patient with it. So you mentioned taking longer with the antiquing versus just the entire process of building the muzzleloader. And so overall, like from your kit arriving in the mail to it being done and completely ready to take to a rendezvous, how much time, uh, I, I'll say shop time because everybody's free time is totally different, but how much time in the shop are you thinking for, you know, the whole process? <sighs> You know, I think you're probably looking about, 
you know, for the way I finish something like like this Invest Arms kit, I'm probably looking about 40, maybe 50 hours on it by the time I'm done with it. Because, like I said, I'm working on it in kind of, you know, maybe three to four hours at a time max. Um, each of the the videos that I do has been about half an hour uh, mm -hmm. to 45 minutes or so, and that's usually about half the time that I spend on that particular piece that I'm working on um, as far as the videos to like real life uh, translation of time goes. Mm -hmm. um, you can spend less and you can spend more. I mean, like we said earlier, uh, you can dry fit all of your parts and do a little filing and be done with it in the weekend and, and you know, have a nice, have, have a decent looking stock and a, and a good fit on all your hardware and go out and start shooting if you want to mm -hmm. uh, very easily. And it's, it's where you start kind of looking at, like I talk about with historic reference or other contemporary builders and artists out there, we start to get some ideas that start to add time to it. Like uh, I've been, excuse me, like I've been uh, referencing the the Gemmer, the an original Gemmer Hawk in, in the in the book that I've been I've been showing, trying to get some of the details on on the, that original into this kit. You know, just for my own personal taste and pleasure on it, and that that adds a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think my estimate almost doubled once I got that book out and, and realized how much I could do. And, uh, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to see as far, how far I can go with it and, and really enjoy it. Yeah. I think some of it depends on the kit that you have because some mm -hmm. kits like, uh, they're a little bit more cut and dry, you know, ready to just kind of fit and, you know, you fit them all together, stain them, do a little bit of sanding yep. and you're good to go. Other ones are a little rougher. And so, and mm -hmm. I think we talked about that some on our last podcast, but um, you know, what are some kits that, uh, you would suggest for somebody that maybe this isn't their first kit, but they're looking for a little bit more of a challenge. What are some kits out there that are a little rougher that they could go for? I think for a, a kit, you know, if, if it's your second kit or you want to do another kit and try something out, or you want a little bit of a challenge, I think you really want to start at kind of the invest arms, Lyman, Pedersoli line when it comes to kits. Uh, they're certainly affordable, I think, when it comes to, to what you're getting and, and the amount of time you can put into them as, to, as far as the quality of parts and, and what you can turn them into. Um, and you're going to come out with, I think, a, a nice muzzleloader and you have enough room to breathe, I think, is, is really important. On some of the, the cheaper muzzleloader kits that are out there, I think mainly from traditions while well, I love my traditions kits and I'm, I'm looking at trying to pick up a few more to, to put together. Uh, there's really not a lot of room to flex your creative muscles on those, but as you get up into like this invest arms, I've been really, really impressed with how much and how far we can take it. And I hear similar things about the Lyman and the Pedersoli kits as well, as far as kind of the, um, Italian imported kits that you can get your hands on. Yeah. And I know that, uh, Italian Firearms Group, we actually got to spend some time with Justin Dodd, who's one of the owners yeah. of Italian Firearms Group. And Petter Soli, uh, is, they, they import Petter Soli. They're pretty much Petter Soli in the United States, for those of you that, yeah. that don't know yet. Um, but some of the stuff that he was saying about the lengths that they go through to make something period correct are extensive, um, you know, just absolutely yeah. unbelievable. And so... What uh, are some of the most period correct muzzle loaders? Because you also have had your hands on a lot of actual originals. Um, yeah. What I, are some of the most period correct models that somebody could buy if they wanted to put together a kit? I think it goes back to um, kind of what you're looking for. I think the the traditions Civil War era muskets and things are, are pretty close from what I've been able to see. Um, and really the, the Invest Arms I think is is pretty decent as far as historic accuracy goes. Like I said, I'm real impressed with it. And, um, and I think you really though, start to get into a new level when you start getting into the Petter, Pet when you start getting into the Petter solely, uh, kind of price bracket for it, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more than some of the other kits that are out there. Mm. But with that, you're getting better components and you're getting that increased accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and really from there, you go up into kind of some of the American made shops, you know, talking about, Dixie Gunworks, Track of the Wolf, um, Chambers, Pecatonica, and uh, I think more most recently the the Kibler series of long rifles. Um, Jim has done a lot of extensive research on his, um, and he's really found a nice balance between the historic accuracy that you expect from a lot of the kind of older. Uh, kit manufacturers like Chambers or, or Track of the Wolf or Dixie mm -hmm. and brought it into the uh, ease of assembly like you see in kind of the Invest Arms, Traditions, Lyman, and Petter Soli line, which is, has been really exciting to see. 
And you mentioned an a- accuracy difference between, you know, like when you jump up to the Petter Solis. Uh, what are some good kit options for somebody who's looking to compete at a rendezvous or go to, you know, uh, one of the shoots in Friendship or something like that? If you, it, it depends on what you're, what you're looking for. So I, I grew up, my family thing was, was competitive black powder. So we can go all the way up uh, to, you know, full custom <laughs> pistols that don't really look like <laughs> muzzleloaders anymore, but they still are. Mm. Um, you know, I've been seriously impressed with, with my tradition, St. Louis Hawken. Uh, when the, the first video I put out of shooting at the shooting that muzzleloader, that was my first time shooting it. Mm. And I had a nice group offhand at 25 yards, much more than, than folks I'd, I'd heard talking about those. So if that's what you can get your hands on and that's what you want, I, you're not going to go wrong with one of those. You, you spend your time on it with it and, and get the load development, right. It's going to be a sure shooter. I promise. As long as traditions doesn't make me a liar there, but <laughs> I don't think they will. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, as far as manufacturing goes, when we, when we look at all of this, not to nerd out about it, but the manufacturing capability we have now at such an affordable level makes these entry level muzzleloaders really accurate for what you're paying for, mm-hmm. I think. And it's something that you can pay more for. Like, um, you know, my Kibler has a rice barrel in it. The Kiblers that are being produced now, uh, the the 45 calibers and up, have the green mountain barrel in them, which are a legendary match competition muzzleloading yeah. barrel. And you can get a variety. Um, there's like Burton barrels. Uh, Charlie Burton makes those, which are great. Colerain barrels, all competition tested. It really comes down to how much you want to spend and what you want. But there's some big names out there you can get your hands on. And you're going to get extreme accuracy out of your muzzleloader, uh, more so than a lot of people if you're coming from kind of a modern firearms or modern shooting sports uh, really think about. Um, I mean, there are folks now shooting, you know, iron sights, muzzleloaders out to 1,000 yards, out to 1,200 yards Mm -hmm. uh, with incredible accuracy. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, like, like shooting that with a center fire, but you're still using a muzzleloader and you're using a, a muzzleloading projectile and barrel with it, which is super impressive. And you're using open sights. Yeah. <laughs> which and that's you're using open factor. sights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause that was, I was shocked cause you know, obviously Petter Soli, they do a lot of that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. some of the distances that Justin was saying that they were able to shoot with a traditional muzzleloader was just insane. I mean, those, if you yeah. told me that you were ringing steel at 1200 with, a paramount, you know, I'd be pretty impressed, but to say that you're doing yeah. that with a side lock is just ridiculous, you know? Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. And, and that's the, that's the great thing about muzzleloading is there's something for the price point and the level that you want to take it to. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, the great thing about it is like, when you look at like the invest arms, the Lyman the old Thompson center kits, and even the Petrosoli kits, a lot of the builders and manufacturers here in the States, several of them make drop-in components Mm -hmm. for those line of products. So if you're shooting your kit and you think you, you want to go start competing, or if you want to, you know, go win some gold at at some of the rendezvous or something in your area or take it super seriously, you can invest in those components. And a lot of times drop them in, rework your loads. You know, you can have a a super fast lock and you can have a really tight American made barrel. Mm. And it's hard to go wrong with that. Just dropped in, you know, to your normal, your normal muzzleloader that you have. So that's something that for folks to look into, if you're maybe thinking about upgrading, you know, see what the aftermarket parts market is like mm. for your muzzleloader. Cause you might be impressed at, at what you can do to push the limits of your muzzleloader. Yeah. And I, I also kind of want to reiterate what you just said of there's something for everybody, you know, yeah. And, you know, I just made a post today about, you know, there's something, yep. <laughs> there's something for everybody. And, um, it's so true because even if you don't really like guns or you don't really like shooting, you can go to like, cause a lot of the people at our local rendezvous, you know, they show up with their wives and their families and, you know, sometimes the wives like to shoot and sometimes they don't, they just go and hang out and have a good time with the community. And so literally there is something for anybody you might think oh you know i don't like guns well you know you still could enjoy it you know you still can enjoy the culture and the people and the community that is found in muzzle loading yep exactly yeah and um on accuracy as well i have something else that's like way 15 miles in the rear view that i want to kind of return to at some point but uh, while we're on the topic of this the the twist rate um 
mm-hmm. how does twist rate affect accuracy? Because uh, I actually made a video about it today, but I really want to get your take on it um, as far as, you know, specifically round ball, but also, you know, sometimes when you use a mini ball and things like that. So twist rates are just another element of that manufacturing. And, and as we look at muzzleloader manufacturing across time, when we look at the entire scope of it from the beginning to now, we have advancements in that technology. I mean, you're going from folks hand forging barrels and hand rifling them, you know, in the 1700s to, you know, machine precision barrels now where you have tight precision twists similar to that of, of modern centerfire rifles. But it, those twist rates are really practical for specific uses. So, Mm. When you're talking about real traditional round ball shooting, a lot of those early barrels, which is starting to be, as we research more, there are more findings that older barrels weren't necessarily as slow twist as we thought. But mm. that's something that is kind of unraveling at this point as, as people do more and more research. But traditionally, we think about round ball barrels being uh, around 1 in 60 twist rates and even up to one in 66, one in 72 in some barrels. A lot of folks claim that a one in 72 twist rate barrel is the perfect twist rate for your round ball muzzleloader. Hmm. But as we advance through time and projectiles changed, firearms changed and, and the components for them changed, we got to shooting conicals, lead conicals, you know, maxi mini balls, and then actual into conicals and things. And we started to figure out that we needed to stabilize that conical. You know, a round ball really stabilizes itself because as it's turning over itself, there's nothing Mm. that can get out of whack. Ideally, it's perfectly round. So as it travels down range, it kind of balances itself out. And that one in 60 twist keeps that straight Mm. for as long as you can keep a round ball going. But when it comes to the conical, you now get kind of an oblong shape where your one end is, you know, in the Y axis, as you look down the conical, it's one length and it's different compared to the width. So that could, would start to tumble in the air if you weren't stabilizing it like a football. So we start to shorten up that twist rate, tighten up that twist rate. And that stabilizes those bullets and those conicals for those longer range precision, you know, more precision shots, depending on what you're doing. And so as we develop that and we kind of get into the modern muzzleloading age, which, you know, there are people doing all of this before, you know, I'm talking of kind of 1920s really here where we start to see muzzleloading step into a new era because we had kind of fallen out of popularity with cartridge arms and kind of have a, a generation pick it up and say, you know, these old things are, they're really neat. There's more we can do with them. And they start experimenting with them more and more. Mm-hmm. And so you get into the early 19 or the mid 1900s. And we start to getting into like the kind of one in 48 twist that a lot of folks are familiar with now, which is developed as kind of the hybrid twist, something that's slow enough to still shoot a round ball and fast enough to shoot a conical. Now, some folks argue that it's, you know, when you're good at both of those, you're not great at either, but it all depends on, on what you're doing with it and, mm-hmm. and what kind of performance you need out of your muzzleloader. So, uh, and even now we see with traditions this year, launching even more, I think one in 24 or one in 22 twist barrels uh, yeah. that they've been talking about. And CVA has been doing the same thing. And you're even getting down into the higher end modern muzzleloaders are getting into one in 18 and one in 16 mm-hmm. twist rates. Which, when you think about a muzzleloader, that's really tight, but you're shooting a really modern muzzleloading bullet out of it. It's designed for that, designed to take it. You know, So it's all about what you're trying to do with them, but the twist rate matters so much. And I think it's something that a lot of folks can, and can kind of skip over mm-hmm. when they're shopping for their muzzle loader. And it's, it's really something to keep in mind, I think. So let's talk about the Whitworth, um, specifically, because that was one of the most, like the original sniper rifle, pretty much. Um, I, it was my understanding that the Whitworth had a very fast twist rate, even by today's standards, um, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of like 120 plus or minus some. Uh, and so do you have much knowledge on that and how that worked? Yeah. So those were kind of the, uh, the there's the, um, I, I, let me preface this with, I, I know a little bit about those. I don't know mm-hmm. enough to be an authority on them. Uh, the research press is a website out there that if you're interested in these early English long range rifles to check out, 
there's also British muzzleloaders on YouTube has done a lot of extensive research on it. Uh, I just want to preface that, you know, so yeah. if I say anything, check with these guys because they can absolutely verify it. Uh, they've done actual testing with them and things. But when you get into the Whitworth, that was kind of a step forward uh, in firearms manufacturing where you had somebody taking a look at military firearms use and really starting to work with it in, in a more modern sense, taking that next step forward. Mm. Because with those original Whitworth bullets, I mean, the famous thing about the Whitworth is it's hexagonal bore. Yeah. And if you're casting and using those original hexagonal bullets, that the bullet mold that you're using actually lines up with the twist of the barrel. So you're getting a full bore engagement out of your projectile, which isn't something that we see a lot of at that era. You're starting to see it come into vogue and you see it after, mm. you know, whether inspired by or not, when you get into kind of the paper patched, you know, black powder cartridge rifles that begin to move West. But it's all those, you know, mainly being that, you know, you have a lead conical and aer more aerodynamic, we'll say, than a round ball, and you have full bore engagement. And these are all kind of things that you see modern precision shooters measuring bullets and measuring their hand loads for to mm. get as much out of their rifles as they can. And it was no different in the mid to, you know, early to mid 1800s when you're talking about muzzleloading firearms. Yeah, and that makes total sense to me because you see the same thing now. You know, a longer bullet yep. with a fast twist rate going really fast means it's going to be accurate, you know, and that's what you see with yep. the Whitworth for the most part. So, yeah, modern precision shooters, if you take them back 150 years, they would have been trying and, and working with the same kinds of things. You know, mm -hmm. you can look up the, the original Creedmoor matches were huge. Uh, you know, you had the Americans and the English and the Irish going head to head on, on muzzleloading precision. Mm -hmm. uh, another rifle to note is the, the Rigby rifles kind of came in uh, a little bit during the, the Whitworth era and then kind of after they were kind of took the next step, I think. Uh, from Whitworth. But so if you're interested in that stuff, there's a ton of great research out there keeping those rifles alive and the history of them. And because you kind of get into a more modern sense of muzzleloading for the 1800s, you have a lot of documentation for it now. You have modern or, or more modern manufacturing processes and paper keeping, actual businesses. You're mm -hmm. getting away from kind of the, the thought of the backwoods muzzleloader or the individual <laughs> gunsmith, yeah. you know, putting stuff together. You have some real documentation, which is great. For sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't, this is going to be a little bit of a, a gear shift. So, you know, hopefully you don't get whiplash too much, but I want to go way back to a question I had about, um, we were talking about antiquing the, uh, the hardware and stuff and in our past podcast and uh in this one and in the videos i watch so i'm not very familiar with the uh, woodworking tools that you use because you've talked about a rasp a file half round you know uh, i think it's like rat tail and like these different mm -hmm. things um can you kind of explain that a little bit more for people that are looking to get into that yeah, so I really encourage you if you're, you know, not driving while you're listening to this, you know, uh, go to like woodcraft.com. They're a, a big American tool supplier, um, sell a ton of uh, different qualities or levels of, of tools that you can look at. But when I'm talking about these different files and things, you can look them up and, and see pictures of them. So like the main descriptor for a lot of these tools comes down to their profile and their shape. So, you know, just a normal flat file is going to be kind of a rectangular file uh, with four sides. Get into a half round file, it's going to be flat on one side and round on the opposite side. So that gives you a flat file on one side and then a round file on the other side. And then you have a normal round file, which is just, you know, the same roundness all the mm. way around, you know, has an even diameter. And then like a, a rat tail file is going to be a, a file that takes the shape of a rat's tail. So back by the handle, it's going to be a little bit thicker. And as you get down to the tip, it's going to taper mm. a little bit. And that's really nice because you can use the same file to get into a tight spot or you can use and you can use that file to, to you know, make a wider, more aggressive stroke, depending on what you're using. It's a little bit hard to explain verbally. You know, so like I said, you know, check out some of the the images that you can find online a lot of times especially if you're just getting into or just starting kind of your tool collection here you can pick up an affordable kit 
uh, that has like six or eight or 12 or 15 different files in it. And it's going to have a variety of those different profiles in different sizes. Mm. Uh, I don't know enough off the top of my head about the different sizes, but in each of these profiles that we're talking about, and there are more out there, you can have, you know, kind of a micro, you know, really tiny, it's like maybe an eighth of an inch round, mm. you know, round file for getting to a really tight spot. And that goes all the way up to, you know, maybe like an inch and a half, like yeah. huge <laughs> file or rasp, you know. Uh, so you can start to find the, the parts and pieces that you need uh, for your specific use. The files that you use on your muzzleloader aren't necessarily the same files you'll use on your car, you know, mm, if you're working yeah. on a car. <laughs> and so uh, the difference between a file and a rasp, uh, yeah. what is the main difference there? So a file is going to have even kind of nice machined teeth and the rasp is going to be really aggressive. It's going to have still okay. even teeth with it, but it's going to look more like a, a porcupine. It's just going to be super aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's going to just be carving grooves into your, into your wood or your metal as you're working with it. Um, the file is really kind of the original sandpaper mm -hmm. because you have an, an, different levels of coarseness with it and you do with rasps as well but rasps are really an aggressive uh, shaping tool so think of it as like a, a, an aggressive drum sander or orbital sander where you really want to hog out a bunch of material quick you're not really worried about the accuracy because you know you have enough to work with mm -hmm. you're going to go in there with that rasp and just clean it out get it close and then you'll move in with your files and then ultimately to your sandpaper so just like we talk about grits mm -hmm. Your 80 grit sandpaper is pretty rough. That's going to be like a rough rasp. Mm. And then as you get up to like 150, there you're starting to get into some nice file territory. And then up to 200, you're in really fine file territory. And then up and up and up, you know, as your tools go. Now, you don't necessarily yeah. need all of those different levels of tools. You can get by with a, a pretty coarse file and some sandpaper and do everything that we've been talking about. If you're building on a budget, you know, you can get some medium coarseness files. I talk about that a lot in the series and your sandpaper, you'll be good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, one thing too, uh, is kits I've always thought of is like a good family project. Um, and I know that our friend Joe D, you know, he always has his kids in the, in the shop with them and stuff. Um, but if somebody's looking into getting into, you know, building a kit, is that a good opportunity to spend time or is it kind of more of a one person project or what does that look like? You think? I think it depends on what kind of person you are. If you're really detailed <laughs> about it, you know, maybe you don't want a, a little kid pawing at you and asking questions all the time, which, mm. you know, I, I can understand that, you know, like my, my shop cat will interrupt me every now and then, which gets <laughs> shop a little, cat, man. A little Le legendary <laughs> legend. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I've been thinking and, and talking with a lot of people about, about muzzle loading and kind of the culture around it, trying to understand it a little bit more from somebody coming into it. Mm. And I, I've talked a lot for a while now about muzzle loaders being kind of the perfect introduction to firearms in general, because they're so slow. They're not very loud in comparison and they're not really aggressive at all. It's hard mm. to make a muzzle loader aggressive. And I think in talking with people, I've come to realize that a kit can be that as well. I mean, if you have, even if you're just introducing somebody, be it a, a kid or a teenager even, to firearms or muzzleloading in general, I mm -hmm. think a muzzleloading kit is a perfect introduction to it because they can see all of the parts and pieces and how they work and how they work together mm -hmm. and give them a greater understanding and ultimately a greater education as to how all of those parts and pieces fit together and how they make the the ultimately the firearm work. And I think when we talk about modern firearms education and making sure that everybody is safe and coming into it in a safe manner, that's what we talk about with modern firearms. And it's the same with muzzleloading firearms as well. And so I think if you are interested in muzzleloading, if you have a kid that is, mm -hmm. you know, even if they can't, you know, if they're like five or six, you know, I'm not necessarily taking a 50 caliber Hawken out to the blind with you or to the stand or something, but you know, building that with them and, and getting them hands on with it is, I think, super important and something that, you know, maybe not as a teenager necessary, they will, you know, think about fondly. But I know as soon as they, you know, start becoming an adult, they're going to look back on that time super fondly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it gets back to, I think, what we talked about last time, you know, 
the exit of shop class and a lot of art classes or hands-on classes in, in schools. You know, building a muzzler kit is the perfect opportunity for you to, you know, get hands-on and show your kids and, and teach your kids a little bit about making something with their hands. Yeah. I think they're good. in the end, they would treat it a lot more with a lot more care than they might with their Nerf gun, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, comes home from the store and you peel it out of the cardboard. And that's not to say that the same, you know, if you buy a new muzzleloader, your kid's not going to appreciate it. But when you, you're at least exposing them a little bit to that process, they can, you know, realize that there's time and, and effort put into this. And I think it just builds that value with it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that recognition that this is something interesting and neat, maybe, that they hold on to later in life. I totally agree. Um, and I kind of want to close with this thought uh, and this yeah. question here. And that is... Uh, what are some ways that we as individuals can grow the sport of muzzleloading? Because like you said, um, shop class is on the decline uh, and, you know, really our culture as a whole is kind of getting away from the kind of slow pace things that are muzzleloading, you know? Um, And I think the youth, I think like kids are one of the keys to that and getting young people involved. But what are some other ways as people are kind of walking away from this podcast that, that they can, grow muzzleloading in their own community? I think first and foremost, uh, in, in a video I put out, you know, I, I receive a lot of questions and a lot of emails about this, but I think first and foremost, if somebody is, is reaching out, you know, to you personally, or you see them reaching out online, I think it's important to just be nice. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, you know, as veterans in the sport, we can be set in our ways and not think about how somebody is coming in and maybe the path that they took coming in. Uh, and that's just something that we do in in everything, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think kind of thinking about where they're coming from and and thinking about the challenges they might have coming into it. I mean, none of us can find caps right now. You know, (laughs) the the inventory of stuff is, is a little light, you know, so it's good to be patient with folks. Um, you know, when it gets down to the, the grassroots person, uh, I think it's up to us to, to get the word out about it. And I think the great thing about muzzleloading is it's not boring. Everything about muzzleloading is really neat. As slow as it is and as old as it is as a sport and as a hobby, it's still really neat because there's nothing really out there like it. I mean, if you're into history, you can be interested in muzzleloading. If you're interested in art, you can get into muzzleloading. Mm -hmm. Literature, you can get into muzzleloading. Shooting, you can get into muzzleloading. You know, there's... Even if you're just interested in camping, I mean, half the people yeah. that I know that like muzzleloaders, they just like going out and camping and having a flintlock set up next to the tree, you know? No joke, yeah. Um, and as I continue kind of through this year, I'm going to be talking about that a lot more on the channel, uh, on my, the YouTube channel there, just about, you know, getting the word out on social media in your local area, mm-hmm. you know, trying to get involved with your local clubs because – unless you're out West kind of out in the middle of nowhere, I would argue that there's a club, you know, within an hour's drive or so of of where you're at. And you're going to find a lot of really knowledgeable people there. Mm -hmm. Um, But in that age and in that knowledge that they have, they might not necessarily be interested in in getting online and talking about muzzleloading online. If you're a young person and you can find a club that is, is willing to be a part of, or, you know, willing to get out there a little bit more, being that person that steps up and says, Hey, I'll put our flyers on Facebook Mm -hmm. or I'll put my, I'll put the flyers on Instagram or, or, you know, post them even around the local hardware store, the diner, Mm -hmm. you know, that's all the kind of stuff that kept muzzleloading going from, you know, the invention of smokeless firearms to kind of its boom in the mid 1900s that we've seen here. And that's all stuff that we can continue to do. And even if you're not, even if you're not near club or you're, you're not interested in joining a club, I totally understand I think one of the greatest things that we can do is, is publish stuff online about it. Again, mm-hmm. going back to how cool muzzleloading is and how all the gear is cool with it. The number of people I meet and interact with on Instagram alone that are asking about getting into muzzleloading or want to get into muzzleloading just because of cool pictures that we're all sharing about muzzleloading and the gear yeah. is phenomenal. I don't know if any of them are going to go out and go hunt or shoot or at all, but I know they want to collect the stuff and mm-hmm. hang it on the wall at least like yeah. it's a work of art. And if at a base level, if, like I get it. You don't want to be online all the time. I don't want to be online all the time either. <laughs> and I, I, I really value my alone time, you know, to, to be with my family and be out in the woods. 
But, you know, posting a photo or two a week or a month even of your gear or, or when you're out there doing something. You know, you don't have to post location. You don't have to post your face or any identifying information. Mm-hmm. You can keep it still pretty private and humble. Yeah. But sharing that stuff and, and showing people the variety of ways that you can get into muzzleloading, I think, just shows how large the community is. I mm-hmm. think before muzzleloading on Instagram really kind of – really. I don't know, kicked up a flurry over the past few years, the past five years, I'll say, Um, you know, I didn't really know where the community was going or how, how it was going to be, but there's so many people out there. I think you can find a community online. And uh, I think, I guess my closing statement for it would be to, to try to find your community, whether it was local, you know, to where you're at or online and, and start interacting and creating bonds with these people mm-hmm. because you're going to make lifelong friends and you're all going to work together, you know, inadvertently to show how cool it is yeah. and, uh, and get more people involved. I completely agree. I think you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I think it's it's awesome. I mean, really muzzle loading is something that I've been involved in for, you know, probably 7 years, but I'm pretty young, so that's that's a good portion of my life. But, you know, that's the one thing I've always loved about it is that there is something for everyone. And, you know, I mean, that's really all I have to say. I think you covered pretty much everything else. <laughs> um it- so, if people can, I mean, get on YouTube. Oh yeah, uh, I know that. I know that. You know, the there's you know censorship concerns and things. There are other platforms out there like Utreon and Odyssey. I encourage people to check out because they are muzzleloader and firearms friendly. But even if you're just shooting, you know, your local woods walk, or if you, if you have a woods walk out there, you know, don't worry about being perfect. You know, I want you to be safe, and I want you to show yourself being safe on the videos and things. But get out there and, and you know. Do a little video of you having fun, you know, Mm. edit it on your phone or your tablet or your computer and put it out there and, you know, send it to me and I'll share it and make sure people see it if you're worried about not people not seeing it. But people can't get into it and become involved if they don't know that it's out there. And as long as as folks in the community are out there, again, showing how cool it is, there's Mm. always going to be new people finding that and get involved. And I think of all things right now, you're seeing a lot of grassroots campaigns across all sorts of interests. And I think muzzleloading is one that benefits extremely well because statistically there's not really a reason for it to still exist other than it's cool and people like it. Yeah. And when you think about it that way, I mean, you know, a lot of the industry, you know, maybe doesn't necessarily need it if people weren't interested in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And as long as folks that are interested in it are given back a little bit, you know, just by posting some photos or some videos about it and sharing what they know to newcomers, I think it's going to be, it's going to be fine. I don't, I don't have, I don't see any risk of, of muzzleloading dying out or, you know, being lost. I think, uh, I think it's great. I think it's in a good spot right now. Well, and that's something that you and I are both passionate about is putting out content for muzzleloading. And one other person that I really want to give a shout out to is, uh, Mark Humphreys, who does the black powder maniac shooter. I think think he epitomizes pretty much everything that you've just said because he literally just makes videos of him having a great time and posts them on YouTube. And um, they're awesome. They're great. I love watching his content, you know? And so it's like, it's, (laughs) it's so, it's so, you know, it's such a, it's scary. You know, it is scary to get on camera, to record yourself doing something and to then post it on the internet for other people, especially on YouTube, because YouTube can be kind of harsh sometimes. Yep. Um, but you know, I watch Mark's videos. I'm like, man, that guy just absolutely loves muzzle loading. You know, he's just like, yep. <laughs> and so, um, you know, really take, you know, take inspiration, take heart, because if you just are passionate about it, people are going to love it, you know, and you might get yep. naysayers. Um, but don't listen to the naysayers, you know, listen to good, good criticism, but don't listen to the naysayers, uh, because, yep. Ultimately, if you're passionate about something and you just are doing something that is born of your passion, it's going to turn out good. And, you know, at the very least, you'll have a great time. Yeah. And and at the core, you're doing something to give back a little bit mm-hmm. in showing how much fun it can be. There's a, there's a room for all the safety and all, of, you know, kind of the range officer speak that we see a lot of times. You'll, you'll get a lot of comments about that, you know, mm-hmm. depending on where you're at and what you're doing. But you're 
you're giving back by showing your enthusiasm yeah. and other people are going to find that and see that and see like, okay, I don't need to be an expert to get started in this. Mm -hmm. And that's something I try to do. You know, I show if I dry ball or if my, my mm -hmm. lock doesn't go or, or if I just have a bad target, you know, because that's all part of it. And that's part of the fun with it. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't, I mean, it's just fun, you know, yeah. and I, I think folks like uh, to mention a few others, you know, Duelist 1954, Mike mm -hmm. Bellevue does a lot of great content, a lot of great historical recreation. Bob McBride at Black Powder TV yep. does a lot of really great informative videos. Uh, Brian Kaufman, I talk to a lot out in Pennsylvania. He's just having a good time. Yeah. You know, that's all he wants. He, he comes home from work and he's like, you know, I'm going to go shoot five shots and, and just get my practice in for the week. And he sets his camera up there and. There he goes. You know, he's got yeah. a little kid laughing in the background. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, muzzleloading is just great, and, and all the people involved in it are too. And mm -hmm. I would love to see, you know, as especially as, you know, you have these alternative video platforms kind of starting up and, and kind of catering to gun culture. I would love for there to be just this beehive mm -hmm. of muzzleloading content on one of these platforms as they start to take off because i think mm -hmm. that would just be do wonders for the sport and the community of people seeing you know us out there loading you know one at a time from the front yeah. you know <laughs> um alongside with some of the big youtubers that are kind of shifting and, and distributing on these other platforms i think it's a mm -hmm. great opportunity to get the word out about it i completely agree you know and Honestly, the last little bit of this kind of turned into a, a state of muzzle loading. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I, which is fine. I mean, it's 2022, right? I mean, we got to talk about it at some point. But um, I really like, I really like where muzzle loading's at. I mean, um, last year it was kind of discouraging with, you know, TC going, you know, getting divested and, uh, you know, there was uncertainty with GoX. But I think things are really picking up this year, you know, with uh, Estes buying GoX and, you know, with, you know, I just really think that it's on the up and up. I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, just from what I've seen in our social media channels, on our YouTube channel, um, what I've seen, the growth that you've had, you know, it's like, I think that people are really getting into it. I think they're really picking up on like, wow, this is awesome. You know, I think it's really a growing, a growing community. And I, I want to make a note there too. Like we've had the past year has been, hard to get anything shooting sports related with, with supply chain issues and, and import issues and things and mm. just manufacturing in general. But people, I want to make a, a point though, that people don't need to buy their muzzleloader or their gear to be a part of that community. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody who's out there watching and reading and interacting and commenting, they can be just as much a part of the community as you or I that are going out and shooting every other week or something. Yeah. You know, they're just into it a little bit differently. Now, mm -hmm. you know, down the road, they might invest and, and get the gear and the equipment, you know, depending on their interest. They might just go camping, you know, and dress up like it's 1820 or 1790 or something. Yeah. Or they want to go shoot at a rendezvous or at a competition or something. Or they just want to go hunting. Or they just want to read and, and talk about it online and watch mm -hmm. stuff about it and just absorb it. Just study it and learn it. Because we have hundreds of years of history here that you can just digest. And I, I think it's important to note that, you know, even through the supply chain issues and things in the last year or so, I think we've seen a new avenue of muzzleloading enthusiasts come up here as just kind of the observer, the learner, and the digester. Mm -hmm. That, you know, where they end up, you know, five years down the road, I don't know if they're involved or not, or to the, the degree that they're involved. But there is an incredible amount of people out there that want to learn and want to watch and, and understand mm -hmm. this and, and be entertained a little bit by it, too. And I think that's huge. I think, I mean, there are more eyes watching muzzleloading stuff right now and reading about it online, you know, from a, an individual craftsman, you know, watch it, being able to watch an individual artist, mm -hmm. you know, like you could have never seen before, up to watching, you know, Forgotten Weapons talk about a muzzleloader for a day. You know, mm -hmm. with several hundred thousand views, there are more eyes on muzzleloading, I think, every day now than there have ever been. And that's, that's a point I, I repeat a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something to keep in mind that, you know, Jeremiah Johnson in the theater only reached so many people. And now you have so many more people looking at it every day. And I yeah. think that's incredibly important mm -hmm. to the future of the sport. Yeah, I totally agree. I completely agree. Well, uh, do you have anything else to add, Ethan? No, I'm sorry. I get, I'll get i get a little amped up there, dude. No, you're good. You're good. Like I said before, anything born of passion, 
it's going to be awesome. And I have had just an <laughs> absolute really... blast on our conversation today. So well, um, I appreciate you kind of riding the roller coaster with me because oh, once I get sure. going, I just kind of go. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for good content. It makes for good content. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys are listening to this and you haven't heard, and maybe you're new to the podcast, you haven't heard of I Love Muzzle Loading. Definitely check out uh, Ethan's podcast. Just search I Love Muzzle Loading on Spotify or pretty much any other platform, right, Ethan? Yep. Yeah, yep. I think we're on uh, five or six or so now. I, I can't keep track of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's so many. There's too many. It's like it's like streaming services. There's a new one every minute, it seems like. so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, also, his YouTube channel, uh, he's, in addition to the kit build that he's doing right now, a bunch of other excellent content just it's all centered around – muzzle loading um he does inline stuff and traditional stuff and pretty much anything uh black powder related so uh definitely check out ethan at i love muzzle loading and support his uh his channels and uh, if you guys enjoyed listening to this podcast go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click the bell to receive notifications whenever we post content and uh if you're listening on in uh, just the audio platform be sure to leave a review because that is going to help get our content into the hands of people who need it and maybe these people have never heard of muzzle loading before. So uh, that's one small way you can help support the sport. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys on the next show. Bye.